Moving along with our agenda, without sponsorship, it would be possible to run our national conference, and we are very grateful for Board Namona agreeing to act as a headline sponsor for today's conference. We will hear from three different Board Namona speakers and panellists today, and I'd now like to introduce Dr. John Riley. John is a member of Board Namona's senior leadership team with specific responsibility for delivering the next generation of energy infrastructure projects to Board Namona's expanding portfolio in the electricity market. His team is currently leading an expansion program which will see the company invest in excess of 2.0 billion in expanding its generating fleet with the key focus on renewable technologies to assist Ireland in meeting its security of supply and decarbonisation targets in the period to 2030. John has more than 20 years experience in the energy sector and was previously part of the senior management team at Eden Dairy Power prior to acquisition by Board Namona Energy from the major German utility EON. He has also worked for Fortum, the Finnish utility, and John has served as member of your Electric Environment and Sustainable Development Policy Committee and Irish Business and Employers Confederation Energy Policy Executive, where he previously chaired the Climate Change Working Group. He's currently on the board of the Electricity Association of Ireland. And I'm now delighted to welcome John to the stage and ask you, ask you to address the attendees. Uh, thanks, Sean, and good, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And, and, and first of all, can I, can I say, first of all, how happy Board Mona is to be sponsoring the, the 21st conference. And I think, as, as Paddy said earlier on, uh, the 21st, the 21st birthday is a big one, though I, I, I have a, my eldest boy is 17, and he said to me recently, no, Dad, you're, you're completely out of touch. The 18th birthday is the bigger one. And, and I'm quite sure when he's 20, he'll tell me the 21st is a bigger one as well. So look, uh, very, very welcome to, to everybody this morning. Delighted to be sponsoring the conference. What I, what I wanted to do very briefly as part of the keynote address is to, to give a view from Board of Mona as to how important we think bioenergy is, not just to the heating and transport sectors, which, which is completely obvious, but the role that bioenergy is playing and can continue to play in the electricity sector. And there's always a lot of debate over whether we should be using, where we should be using bioenergies. I think it is really, really important for a gathering such as this to understand that Ireland won't meet its climate action targets and it won't meet its security of supply imperatives without a mix of technologies. So it's not a case of this technology versus that technology versus the other technology. We need everything at the table, but of course it has to work together and it has to work economically. That's absolutely key. But I think the, the, so I'm going to focus a little bit on electricity. Um, and it's a sector that has, as we know, great strides have been achieved in terms of decarbonizing the electricity sector. But we still face enormous challenges in terms of what we have to do, really enormous challenges. But I think the nexus of two critical things is going to provide, in the short to medium term, a real, real opportunity for bioenergy in the sector. And that nexus is the, 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 the confluence of the very, very significant growth in demand for electricity. We've, we've all seen it. Um, total electricity demand today is somewhere about 32 or 33 terawatt hours. Some of the analysis that we have done in Board Namona shows that by 2030, that will have risen to somewhere between 40 and 45 terawatt hours. And by 2035, which is a key period for Board Namona strategically, that could have risen to as high as 50 terawatt hours. It doesn't really matter if you understand what terawatt hours. It grows from about 30 to 50 in a decade. That's enormous, absolutely enormous. But the nexus of that growth with the imposition of carbon budgets and carbon ceilings, in our view in Board Namona, changes everything. Changes everything. And this is a picture that I think is well understood by people. It's the, it's the breakdown of the carbon emissions from the, the, the total economy in 2021. And of course, a lot of the discussion at that time was in the last, when these budgets were produced over the summer, was about agriculture and the challenges that agriculture face. And we're not going to go into that this morning from our perspective. What I want to focus on is the electricity sector. And it, it passed almost unnoticed that the total emissions from the electricity sector in 2021 is around 10 million tonnes. The analysis that we've done shows that that figure could rise as high as 11 million tonnes this year. And in the context of the carbon budget that was issued for 2021 to 2025, which was 40 million tonnes, 
electricity, this sector that's doing really well, will have gobbled up more than half of its total budget in the first two years. Fact. So when you, when you roll that analysis out and you take the carbon budgets into play, and uh, we're, we're of the view that at the very, very most, at the very most, this sector might be allowed to emit 3 million tonnes of CO2 emissions in 2030. Now, I'm going to tell you that from where I sit today, that is almost impossible. That's almost impossible to achieve. So whatever the, the challenges that agriculture, heating and transport have, this sector has an enormous challenge as well. So how might we get there? And this is where we think, in the short to medium term, there could be a massive opportunity for bioenergy in the electricity sector. We've done a very detailed piece of analysis looking out to actually 2035. And a couple of things that, that I want to call out here, um, and it's quite controversial at times, you have to be careful what you say and how you say it, but anybody who thinks that the electricity sector or Ireland Inc. will have seven gigawatts of offshore wind installed and operational by 2030 knows absolutely nothing about what, what's involved in doing that. I'm not saying for one moment that we won't have some offshore wind in the mix. We will. We're involved in the sector. And I can tell you it's incredibly challenging. Incredibly challenging. So we believe in the analysis that we've done that by 2030, Board Namona or, or Ireland Inc. would probably have around three gigawatts of offshore wind. So therefore, to stay within these emission ceilings and to keep the lights on, we will need to see a significant expansion in the plans for onshore wind, something that we're very, very good at. But even with that, guys, if you're to keep the emissions within 3 million tonnes, there's one absolute imperative. The only fossil fuel that we can use in the electricity sector by 2030 is gas. And that gas must be burned in the most flexible units you can have, which are combined cycle gas turbines. Today, we in Board Namona, to keep the lights on, are burning distillate in open cycle units, just to keep the lights on. So we've got to move away rather quickly to, f from doing that. And what you'll see we're planning to do is on two fronts. We want to increase the amount of biomass that you, we're using for electricity generation and residues. But on the other side, we want to take, we have taken peat, by the way, almost completely out of the energy mix, and we'll do so completely next year. Board Namona, the, um, the energy, the, the, the peat company, will no longer have anything to do with peat next year. So that's the biggest step we've taken forward in terms of our climate action program. But we need to replace that energy with renewable forms of generation, not with other fossil fuels. So fact, point number one from our perspective is we are currently today um, burning around 600,000 tonnes of residues and sustainable biomass in our bubbling fluidized bed boiler in Eden Dairy. And the importance of that firm thermal capacity in assisting the deployment of renewables, intermittent renewables across the system, should not be understated. It's a unit that can reduce its load down at night time to 40 megawatts. It's very, very flexible. And it'll be doing that next year with zero carbon emissions coming from it. But we have room for up to a million tonnes of residues and sustainable biomass to be used in this facility. And that's a, a target that we're putting out there today, and my colleagues will talk a little bit more about how we hope to do that. But that's a real opportunity just in the biomass and the residue space. So someone might ask, what's he doing talking about Eden Dairy with a picture of a wind farm up here? This is something that we're, we're doing and doing very well in Bordemona. This is a picture of what I call offshore onshore. This is a picture of our Onini wind farm which we've developed on a joint venture basis with ESB up in the corner of, 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 of West Mayo, where the wind speeds are higher than you get offshore in the North Sea. Fact. And today, we have 100 megawatts of capacity operational. We have another 100 megawatts um, under the final stages of construction and commissioning. And we have another 100 megawatts in development. And the point of that is that that complex, in three or four years' time, will have 300 megawatts of operating wind in a very, very windy part of the world with the latest technology, and it will still only produce a terawatt hour of energy, which is exactly what, bore, what the Eden Dairy Power Station could do on sustainable and carbon neutral fuels, and that is one of the most important things that we want to do. So in the context of, of, of us moving forward in that regard, what, we, what we're doing is we're making a very, very significant investment 
in the Eden Dairy complex, as we call it, to make it bioenergy ready. Sorry, it's, it's, it's well on the way to doing that. But what, what we've been doing over the last number of years is enhancing our fuel handling and storage capacity as we move transition out of peat on this site and into biomass. Um, the logistics of dealing with biomass and residues is a little different to peat. Um, the peat stations were located in the middle of the Bog of Allen for a reason. Because when you're, when you're transporting relatively low density fuels, you can't be transporting them over long distances. So our ability to handle and transport this stuff economically is really, really important. So that's the first message. There is a real opportunity here to drive further renewable energy through this site in terms of solid fuel, solid biomass and residues. The second thing, though, is probably the more, more, much more exciting piece for us. We, we, we've, ex we've extended the planning permission on this site. The, the site has planning permission now to continue operating until 2030, at least. We've secured a 10-year capacity contract, which is important to the viable operation of the site. Um, but the other piece that we're, we're, we're looking at is this little bit here, if I can highlight it. Right in the front of the site, we have about 120 megawatts of the latest and greatest flexible gas turbine technology. Four individual engines that we can start up and bring to full load in five minutes. And today, unfortunately, we are running that peaking capacity of distillate. And the, t the power system has become so tight in terms of capacity that this year in the month of August, we burned more distillate and we produced more megawatt hours from that open cycle peaking capacity than we did in its first five years of operation. Now that's a problem from the climate perspective. So what we're doing on this site is we're going to invest, our board recently approved an investment of over 100 million euros in this complex to enhance the use of solid biomass, but more importantly from our perspective, to bring the natural gas pipeline to the site. To allow us, first of all, to switch from distillate to methane, which will be less carbon intensive, but ultimately our strategic goal is to decarbonize that gas. And that's where the other play comes in from a bioenergy perspective. We want to inject biomethane into the national gas network, wherever, and purchase that back out to burn biomethane in these peaking, peaking plants. So that by the time we get to 2030, our intention is to ensure that this complex, which now has 150 megawatts of wind sitting in the front garden, it will have um, hopefully uh, a, giga, a terawatt hour of, of solid biomass, dispatchable biomass coming from the site. And where we need to run our peaking capacity, we're running those on, on, on bioenergy. So that all of the electricity that runs through this important node on the power system will be emission, uh, carbon, zero carbon, carbon emissions free. That's the strategy. And I think in terms of, of, of getting there, the, 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 the important piece of the story, the final piece of the story, is to look at how the power system in, in Ireland is evolving. That's the, the, the generation mix that, that was responsible for the, the, 20, uh, the, the 10 million tonnes of CO2 emissions in 2021. We all know it's dominated by gas on the one hand and, and intermittent renewables on the other. By the time we come to 2035, Bordnemona is of the view, and we'll argue all day about the split between onshore and offshore wind and the big debate that we get into, but Bordnemona is very clear. The Irish electricity sector should be able to accommodate 90% renewables by 2035. And that would leave 10% coming from firm, flexible gas. You cannot run the entire system on wind and solar. We all know that now. By the way, we always knew that. That, that was never, that's not something that we discovered. All of the studies would have told us that that was going to be the case. So the trick to completely decarbonizing the electricity sector and using that zero emissions electricity as a vector to help heating and transport is to decarbonize that gas. And in the short term, we really do believe that there is a real opportunity here with appropriate policy supports from government to allow direct injection of biomethane into the network. It's already happening, but it needs to happen at a much, much greater scale. And in order to contribute to that, we in Bordemona have just received planning permission for an 80,000 tonne anaerobic digester located just outside of Port Leash. 
I won't tell you how long it took us to get planning permission for it, and unfortunately, that planning decision has, as usual, been taken to the High Court for appeal. But in Bordemona, we're nothing if not determined, and we will stick at it, and we will deliver that project, and we're working with colleagues in Gas Network Ireland to ensure that the biogas that's produced from that unit will be injected into the grid in Port Leash, and we will buy it out on the Eden Dairy site and burn it to, to, to provide that flexible backup. The final piece of the story, though, is producing, replacing all of that biomethane, all of that methane, let's say, by 2035 with biomethane is going to be an enormous challenge. And this is where I come back to my final point, which is the mix and the diversity of what we need from a technology perspective. Because we can see a power system that we will have, if we have seven gigawatts of offshore wind and about 10 gigawatts of onshore wind and maybe three gigawatts of utility scale solar, we will at times be producing more electricity than we need. And rather than exporting that electricity or doing what we do today, curtailing it, we want to install banks of hydrolyzers on our wind farms to use that curtailed energy and to split water, H2O, into its two component parts and produce green hydrogen. Inject that green hydrogen into the network and combine that with a mix of methane and biomethane in order to run this flexible gas-fired capacity. So that by the time we get to 2035, even if we could dilute half of that gas, and it'll be about four terawatt hours, four or five terawatt hours of generation. So it's not as much gas as we use today by any means. But if we could dilute half of that with a combination of biomethane and green hydrogen, we will have effectively a net zero electric power system by 2035. So with that, I leave you with, I suppose, two simple calls to the industry. Continue to work with us in Bordnemona in terms of your ability to, to, to work with us and supply the, 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 the biofuels and the bioenergies that we need as part of our electricity generation mix. I would call on government to really move forward with support mechanisms to encourage the development of a biomethane sector in Ireland. It will be massively beneficial on a whole range of fronts, not just in heating and transport, but also in decarbonising electricity. And the final thing is to wish you all the very, very best of luck today. I, I will be around for a period up till about lunchtime and happy to have a chat with anybody up to that point. But I have a number of colleagues, as Sean has said, who will be, um, who will be, will be around and about today on various panels. And we're very, very happy to engage with you. So have an enjoyable day. And as I said, we look forward to talking to you again. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Sean, um, for your address and for your sponsorship of this conference. And indeed, we look forward to uh, discussing some of the items that you raised in your presentations with your colleagues uh, on the various panels during the day. I think we would fully echo your call uh, for a broad mix of uh, technologies that are required to decarbonize heat transport and electricity. So uh, we look forward to discussing that further as the day goes on.